Okay, so my big seller at San Diego Comic Con was my pug book and the new one that yeah. I have. And this woman at one point, perfectly pleasant woman, comes up and goes, Hey, I want to get this pug book for a friend back home, but they're very religious. Is this a religious <laughs> book? <laughs> a religious and pug book. <laughs> my, uh, I wanted to be so sarcastic in that moment. I don't know what, what would cause me. I didn't say it, but I wanted to say, well... The pug has not yet accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior yet. <laughs> no, it is it is it is an unrepentant pug, as most of them are. <laughs> we, Beth and I were joking around in the booth the rest of the weekend, like, well, I mean, the pug is not explicitly a Satanist, but there are some Satanist elements in the book. So, <laughs> yeah, there there are some themes, some underlying themes of uh, of satanic pugism. Yeah. Well, like, as a Wiccan dog owner, like, the jokes just (laughs) wrote themselves all weekend, you know. Um, But I found out such a strange question, like, oh, this dog book looks lovely. Is it a religious (laughs) book? Like, what? (laughs) All dogs are Satan. All dogs are unreligious. Have you seen where they put their noses half the time? These are not religious creatures. Uh, (laughs) I think that movie might have lied about all dogs going to heaven. I don't know about that. (laughs) Purgatory at best. Yeah, best. Yeah, they're sitting there with Dante working their way up purgatory. That, there's no way there. Uh, so anyway, uh, I, I mean, I get it though. We all have that one cousin that's a little too religious, and you're like, all right, right. we gotta for 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 Greg, we're gonna get him this book. Um, but uh, it just seemed like a weird question for for pugs wow. uh, for a pug related comic strip book. That's so weird. Is it religious? Anyway, <laughs> uh, but but San Diego was really good this year. I got a lot to talk about this week, so let's uh, let's warm it up and and we'll Let, get right into it. Yeah, let's my friend. In, oh yeah, let's intro it up. I want to hear all about it. Well then, hi everybody, and welcome to Comic Lab, the show about making comics. And making a living from comics. I'm Brad Geiger, editor of webcomics.com and cartoonist of Evil Inc. And I'm Dave Kellett, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and co-director of Stripped. And this week's hour of comics advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So Dave, how is San Diego? Well, for everyone that knows or doesn't know, San Diego Comic-Con is five very full days in sunny San Diego along the bay at the convention center there. And it was great this year. Uh, There was a lot to like about San Diego Comic-Con this year. Let's start from the outside in. They pedestrianized a lot of the streets around San Diego in the gas lamp and then down right in front of the convention center. Yeah. So for folks that have ever been to Comic-Con, you know that there is just a cluster of human beings outside that convention center at key hours. It can be really daunting. What's that now? It can be really daunting out there. Yeah, and it's also you're just you're assaulted by human smells and elbows and backpacks, you know, as you try to go 10 feet. And it made the show so much more pleasant. And I honestly, honestly, honestly think it impacted the mood of the show because people I heard far less complaints about people um, standing in lines where people were jerks and this and that because everything was pedestrianized. So they weren't also fighting with buses and trucks and cars and bikes and all this stuff, you know? Yes, yes. So really, a hat hat tip to the San Diego Police Department and the San Diego City Council for letting them uh, pedestrianize a lot of stuff around there. It was uh, it was really cool. What kinds of stuff was found out there? Like in the pedestrianized zone? Yeah, well, you yeah. and I had talked about this before that I thought they might it might be dipping a toe towards a European style convention where you put a exactly. lot of big uh, circus tents out there. Um, and it wasn't that they because the, the roads were unpedestrianized uh, like at 9 p.m. to 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. So I think with good reason, they didn't have any tents up. There's nothing permanent. But what it became, and this was sort of impromptu, was all the cosplayers would go out there all along the first three blocks into Gaslamp, um, kind of like buskers at a subway station. You would see cosplayers every 20 feet waiting and taking photos with this big group that was around them, you know? No, that's awesome. And it was really Because that's really what everybody nice for, wants to do. Plus, you've yeah, got and it was natural really nice light for families. out there. Like, if you've, got, if you've got a 7-year-old and a 10-year-old or whatever, yes. and you're walking through, it's really nice to be able to take all the photos in this nice, open, airy um, less crowd. And you're like, you're not stopping people trying to get to the next row over. You're out in the and, middle of a street. It's fine. You know, it's great. It was a really smart move on San Diego's part. And you get a better photo out of it. You've got natural light. You, you don't have a convention in the background where people are walking around. You've got, you know, like a regular city background. It's, it, it's a fantastic idea. Yeah, and they they didn't have food trucks, but they had food carts out. So the, the kind oh, of thing okay. that a single human could push, you know? Yeah, next best um, thing. 
Yeah, so you were you could get you could get like a New York style hot dog or uh, 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 Mexican street tacos, or you could get ice cream. You know, like small one dollar, two dollar, five dollar items kind of thing. Anyway, Perfect. it was really good. So outside in uh, San Diego, much much improved. I got to tell you though, Brad, much to my chagrin, you may have <laughs> noticed you didn't get a text from the Sci Fi Cafe this year. Oh no, uh, you're not I don't saying. Know what, I don't know what happened, but Sci Fi did not license that whole cafe that they normally do. Oh, uh, the Sci Fi that- Channel. That poor wait staff. How did they make it through the week? <laughs> how, would they, how did they suffer through? Anyway, so that's outside the show. And then you get inside the show. And um, so you probably heard that Marvel and Disney in general is making less of a presence known at San Diego yeah, Comic-Con. Yeah, yeah. Because they want to really start pushing D23 because they have Star Wars, they have Marvel, they have all of Disney, they have Pixar, right? Like, So bring it all in-house, which makes sense. I get it. Yep, yep. They're, they're going to start making all their announcements. So there was still a Marvel presence. There was still a Star Wars presence. And frankly, they were huge. But there were less um, fan-driven panels and reveals at the show. Mm. And I have to say, it it felt like it made a difference in the Comic-Con. Um, like the only, the only big reveal at Comic-Con was that Dumpster Fire Aquaman trailer. And um, <laughs> yeah. by the way, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exhibit... I'm going to exhibit no opinion on this show about how terrible I think Aquaman is because I don't want to, if it's already bad, I don't want to make it worse by telling everybody what a shit show it looks like. So yeah. uh, don't go watch the, oh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I don't know where in, I'm going with that. In the Geiger family, we're going to watch it one way or another because uh, my wife break, breaks into a fever every time that actor, what's his name? Jason Moma? Momoa, uh, yeah. Momoa? Uh, every time that guy gets on the screen, she gets uh, she gets <laughs> a little bit hot under the collar. So I got a feeling we're going to go watch that one, whether uh, I want to or not. <laughs> You're like, I'm taking one for the team for my wife's sake on that one. Yeah, <laughs> no, I get it. very much. Uh, so. I just feel like Aquaman. I have uh, you know how many comics I've done making fun of Aquaman over yeah. the years about yeah, what yeah. a stupid character I think he is. And then to make the whole movie about it and then to cast a guy who obviously chose the voice of a of a, a southern trucker to portray Aquaman. I don't know. Like, I, I just didn't get I didn't get that <laughs> choice of Aquaman. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to go fight some crime. I'm Aquaman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a weird vocal. As soon as I heard the vocal on that, I was like, okay, that's 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 going to be different. That's one of those things where, like, if it's an acting class, the director's like, okay, that was a choice. That was, that a, was choice. a choice. <laughs> that was a choice. Let's try it up a little different. Like, I don't know why. I mean, not that I put much thought into it. I don't know why I always thought of Aquaman as having a vaguely British or somewhat regal voice. But, uh-huh. but to, to me, Aquaman sounded like, yeah, let's go get him. Come on, let's get some grits. And let's go fight them. Oh. Get her done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hold on. Let me just scratch my crotch here. I'm Aquaman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got to go fight the Justice league's enemies anyway <laughs> yikes uh, so there were there were markedly less hall h announcements like the the big yeah. one was uh aquaman and maybe doctor who i don't know and doctor who you know on the on the scale of fandom is like it's it's solid but it doesn't you know it doesn't uh turn out a lot of huge huge crowds anyway so i think by by virtue of that there were more people on the floor this year and it felt less of a media show and more of a comic show a little Whoa. bit i don't want to overdo it yeah, I you know I don't want to. It, it's not like it went it went totally back to what it was in 1998, but it was it felt like maybe what it was 10 years ago, you know, which was interesting. Wow, that's really fascinating. So I don't know if that's going to be permanent. It might just be the cycle of things that there wasn't a, there wasn't a Hobbit movie, there wasn't a Star Wars movie, there wasn't yeah. a, a a big Marvel movie being announced. Like nothing big that in past would have uh, generated fans. Actually. Um, the the big announcement from Marvel that happened over the weekend uh, was a negative one, and I'm starting to wonder whether that was intentional now as well. Uh, Marvel announced that James Gunn was being taken off of the Guardians of the Galaxy third movie because of some tweets that he made uh, a few years ago that were in poor taste. Uh, so you, wait, were you say intentional? You mean you, they? You think they timed that for Comic Con? I don't. I don't know if they timed it necessarily, but I'm. I'm just thinking it is interesting that the one thing to come out of Marvel that I, that caught my radar was a negative story, and maybe they had it, uh, it boiling, and they're like, "Well, we'll just put it out during Comic Con. Uh, we're not throwing out there anything anyway, and we'll save our good stuff for D23." Oh, I see what you're saying. They kind of buried amongst the other news. Yeah, that's exactly. that is conceivable from a PR standpoint. Yeah, I get you. I get yeah. you. 
Um, anyway, uh, the overall mood for the uh, so that's the big picture stuff, right? Yeah. Like the um, the the outside of the show really pleasant. The inside of the show markedly less Hall H announcements this year. And for yeah. those that don't know, Hall H is the sort of five thousand to seven thousand seat area where they would typically bring out, oh, and here's the entire cast of Black Panther. Clap, 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 clap. Here's the trailer, that kind of thing, right? <laughs> right, right. Um, and and justifiably, people wait in line, they get excited. But if you have 5,000 people in a hall and another 5,000 waiting outside the hall to get into that hall, yeah. that's 10,000 people that got taken off the floor. And it's noticeable when Hall H lets out. I we, yeah. it, When I used to do that show with you, we used to be able to tell when the big uh, things were going on down in Hall H because the floor, even at San Diego, would empty out. Yeah. If you take 150,000 people and then suddenly snap your fingers and 15,000 people are gone, you honest to God, you notice it. You do. Well, notice, you, you, you know, one thing, if, if you've done that, you know that your infinity gauntlet is working just fine. I, I noticed that you noticed my snap. That's great. <laughs> that was great. I'm I'm hitting all on all six cend- cylinders over here. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Someone had his coffee this morning. That's right. Um, I did. <laughs> uh, so anyway, a lot of people on the show. Uh, everyone was in comparatively good moods. Also, the weather was pleasant. You know, you've yeah. been to Comic Cons where it's too hot and people come mm-hmm. into the hall and they're just like dying. There's I just want to sit down. Um, right. So all of the externals that can't be controlled were lovely. It was a, it was a really lovely show. And then for me personally, I uh, had I was the best prepared I had been for a long time. I had two new books. I had a bunch of new yeah. pins and new posters and prints and stuff. So it was hands down because uh, I just did the numbers yesterday afternoon. I I've, uh, brought, made all my bank deposits and stuff. It was yeah. hands down the best Comic Con I've ever had, which is great. Wow. And you and you uh, you know the question I'm going to ask yet uh, next because I am a curmudgeon. Did you turn a profit after deducting expenses? Yes, it turned out I wow. I did the math on this too. It was three times cost, so it's great. Holy cats, you did fantastic. Yes, I am that's I you're looking at it you're listening to a very happy Dave Kellett right now. <laughs> so, uh, no questions asked, you signed up uh, and got your space for next year. <laughs> I haven't yet, but <laughs> that's because I was really? busy. No, I have. Uh, that's just because I was busy. Uh, oh, I always okay. email them like a week after the show and be like, "Hey guys, I forgot my. I forgot to pick up the old <laughs> form. Can I? Been twenty years. Can I still go tomorrow? Um, yeah. Uh, so this was my twentieth year, by the way, and wow. I have to say the fact that it was my best show ever, and it was also my twentieth year. That was a really special thing. It was nice that that happened. Yeah. So, so going, do they still have what they call a web comics area? They do. And it's, it's a little sad now Uh because there's only about 10 of us in the web comics area. And there used to be about 30 or 40 of us. Um, And uh, so by what Brad's asking there for people that never been to Comic-Con, there are certain areas that are like a hanging sign from the ceiling. So there's like a fantasy illustrator area. There's a small press area. There's an artist alley area. And there's a web comics area. Yeah. And web comics, when we first petitioned Comic-Con, I don't know, 10 years ago, Brad, to get the mm-hmm. web comics mm-hmm. area designated, there was probably 30 or 40 web comic artists going. You know, it was everybody from uh, Penny Arcade to Jeff Jacks to uh, Rich Stevens to Scott Kurtz. To Brad Scott, Chris and I, uh, to yep. to Patico, to Keen Spot, right? Like Brad, that, that's all the yep. that's some of the big names that are were there. And then oh, everybody everybody stopped going. Phil Folio was always uh, down there in a little yep. anchor position. Yep. And and Phil is still there. Dumbrella is still there. Tapatico is still there. Cyanide and Happiness is there. Looking for Group is there. Um, and I'm there. And a couple other names that folks would remember. Um, but. So it's still like, it's not like it's nothing, but it's, it's not what it was 10 years ago. And for good reason, for the same reason that I don't go to New York Comic Con, it's really expensive to come from the East Coast, fly out, get five nights, sometimes six nights at San Diego Comic Con hotels, yeah. and then also pay for a $2,000 booth. Yeah, like that, those costs add up real quick, which is why I don't do New York. Mm-hmm. Um, so I get it why people stop coming. Um, so what we're left with is mostly the West Coast cartoonists who can drive to Comic-Con and or have a friend to stay with at Comic-Con. Don't you think that's kind of who's left? Uh, well, that's that's when you're describing it, that's very much who who it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. So um, anyway, 
Uh, yeah, so the web comics rows have been diminished, but it's it's so, still fighting. Although here's I heard a from, question. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say I heard from two people this weekend that um, that uh, this might be their their last year. So we'll see um, if that's gonna grow yet, smaller yet. Although there were two cartoonists that came down from Canada this year um, who were very excited. Sam Logan of Sam and Fuzzy. Uh, did great, by the way, at Comic Con, and he's like, "Oh boy, I'm definitely coming back next year." So yeah. uh, we'll see. We'll see. we'll see what happens. So do you, do you think Small Press or Artist Alley ballooned a, a, in size this year? In other words, if if Web Comics is shrinking, is there another group that's enlarging at this particular show? Well, it's I'm I'm glad you asked that because there's a, I have a couple questions for you about yeah. Artist Alley at San Diego Comic Con. Um, so first of all. Uh, San Diego, to their credit, still has an artist alley, and it's substantial. It takes up—I mm-hmm. uh, don't want to uh, overdo it. Let's say it takes up like a fortieth of the show floor, right? Yeah. Um, there's probably a hundred tables of artist alley, and uh, the problem, though, is that it's at the very far end of the convention center from all the exhibitor artists. So all their yeah. publishing houses, all the comic book shops. It's like on the other end of video games and products. <laughs> it's over in no and person's s- land. Yeah, it's like in the ass end of the Comic-Con. So I really feel bad about the Artist Alley location. And then I also yeah. feel bad because right in the middle of Artist Alley, you know how sometimes you get into an old, uh, not like, not a DC-10, but like an older plane. And sometimes they used to run the row not right down the middle of the plane. So you would have four seats on one side and one seat on the other or yes, two seats. Yes. You know what I mean? Like you've ever gotten on one of those weird planes and you're like, why didn't they run the road right down the middle? This is the weirdest yeah. thing. That's what they did with Artist Alley. So you would have seven artists in a row and then a big 20 to 25 foot gap row in the middle where people could walk up and down and yeah. then two more artists on the other side. And you're like, well, those poor artists that are, no one's ever going to walk over there. Yeah. I, I just felt yeah. bad for them, basically. It was a really weird logistical decision on, on San Diego's part. I don't know. There's got to be a reason, but I couldn't imagine what it would be because it seems like it would be very, very simple to just kind of make it go down the middle and equal things up. Yeah, I, my brother and I, my brother-in-law and I were walking that area, and I said, psychologically, do you feel this? We are not going to turn down those rows. And he goes, yeah, yeah. that's interesting. <laughs> I go, those, those people really got shafted. Um, so it was just interesting. Anyway, but here's my question to you, because you might know yeah. this better than I do. So uh, we all know either web cartoonists or artists that could um, either qualify for Artist Alley or Small Press, which mm-hmm. is another area of Comic-Con. But help me out here. What is the difference between small press and artist alley? Like, why differentiate? Well, I I've got a feeling. See, here's the deal. But back in the day, before they had a web comics area, we were all considering uh, just going and taking over the small press area. I remember that being a topic of discussion among right. a lot of web cartoonists. That we would, we would just go over there and and put up our you know put plant our flags and and kind of because we were technically small press. Uh, as far as the difference goes, I don't honestly know, but I'm going to give you my guess based on the little bit I know about how that show works. And that is, as you know, uh, San Diego, there's a, it's one of those deals that once you get in, you got to keep re-upping your booth for next year or, lo- or else you lose your place in line and somebody else comes in and takes it. In other words, there's, there's right. pe- most of the people you see at San Diego were there last year. And the only reason that they got that uh, booth was that they were there the year before and the year before that and the year before that. And supposedly you can't bequeath a booth to anyone else. Uh, but 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 there's that kind of, uh, gra- you know, you keep getting grandfathered in. As a result, it's really difficult to get in to San Diego and, and prove that you've invested in the show in the past. One of the places that you can do that is artist alley. Right. And so I've got a feeling the answer to your question is what's the difference. It's what you could get. In other words, chances are you can't uh, uh, immediately get a place on the floor and that would include small press, but you might be able to get artist alley. So you go in, you buy a place on artist alley and then you're in line for the next time when a, a hole opens up and just like we did <laughs> way back in the day uh you you wait for a hole to open and you take your shot and boom all of a sudden you've got it and now you get your biggest worry is you've got to hold on to it for next year and the year after that because now you're running the treadmill 
But I've right. got a feeling that Artist Alley is probably the, the place, and 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 I'm sure our our listeners will correct me if I'm wrong, but my guess is that's the place where you get your nose in the tent, and then you right. can you can move on from there. Yeah, no, I uh, so I completely concur with you from a, a logistical standpoint in terms of applying to Comic Con, mm-hmm. but I guess what I was asking you was. From a planning standpoint, from Comic Con's planning standpoint, why does that exist? Why, what 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 differentiates an artist alley attendee from a small press attendee? You're saying that, that small nothing. press is the grandfathered area. Yeah, yeah, and and or or a small yes, exactly. Small press is part of the grandfathered area, and uh, and, and and as far as like thematically. And there's no difference whatsoever. Uh, you know, yeah. you, you could you could easily be if you're in small press, you could be in one or the other. Uh, you know, if you're if you're an artist for DC or an art or a writer for Marvel, uh, then you're not as likely to go into small press. You're going to be more likely to go into Artist Alley or to be sitting at your publisher's table. Uh, but but as far as like thematically, nah, there's not there's no real difference there that I can yeah. tell. Yeah, because I I mean, for me, I could see myself being an Artist Alley. I could see myself being in small press. I could see myself being an exhibitor. Like I could see all exactly. The, you could argue one or the other for all those, you know. So, all right, I was just sort of curious what uh, what your thought was was on that. Um, anyway, so I was going to tell you the big the big takeaway that that I had from this show, um, and it's something that you and I have talked about in the past, but this one really cemented it. Which is uh, last year, boy, I thought I was going to do gangbusters at. Um, at San Diego Comic Con, and I'll tell you why. And it was totally ego driven and totally naive to how Comic Cons work. Uh-huh. I had just published my Drive hardcover book. Right, it yeah. was seven years in the making, or whatever it was. It was three hundred pages, <laughs> and it had had a hundred and four thousand dollar Kickstarter. And I was like, "This is going to do great at Comic Con. I'm going to do gangbusters. I'm going to sell yeah. so many of these. I'm bringing fifteen <laughs> boxes of these really heavy books." <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, and those Drive books are big. Yeah, and I'm I'm telling you all this because uh, I had a great year this year, but I want to tell you about the not as great year last year because of yeah. of, of bad assumptions and bad planning. So uh, I brought <laughs> I brought no joke like 15 boxes of these things, <laughs> thinking <laughs> I'm going to sell through the world. I'm going to buy my solid gold car with these books. Anyway, uh, I then proceeded to sell. I don't remember the exact numbers, but let's just say I sold like 15 copies of those, which yeah. at 50 bucks a pop is great, but right. I had a lot of books to bring home last year, like pretty much exactly what I brought I had to bring back with me last year. And there's so, nothing worse than packing up from a convention and carrying all of those boxes out that you didn't sell. <laughs> you know, oh, the humility level, the humility level skyrockets. I've been there. And then. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 it, it is the uh, working cartoonist walk of shame <laughs> is Sunday night when you're walking and you've got a full dolly or, or a full hand cart that you are pushing out your car. That is the cartoonist walk of shame. It's it's the cartoonist equivalent of remember in eighth grade when you would have a dance and all the boys would be lined up on one side of the gym and all the girls oh, would be lined up on the other. Oh, I remember that well. And whoever was brave enough to walk to the other side of the gym and ask somebody if they wanted to dance, and yeah. then they would say no, and then you'd have to walk all the way back Make across that the gym. Long walk back. Yeah. That's the emotional state of a cartoonist that has to bring back an awful lot of books after Comic Con. <laughs> Uh, yes, it's just the long, dark tea time of the soul. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so uh, last year I pro- I was like, the- these books, all oh, that Kickstarter did so great. I'm going to sell so many of these. And here's the dirty truth about Comic-Con is yeah. that, A, it's really hard to entice a stranger into a long form story that they've never heard of before. Yes. Yeah, and that's then true. it's even harder to entice a stranger into a long form story they've never heard of before. That's in a $50 hardcover collection. Like, you're right. You're right. No one. I mean, looking back on it, I don't know why I ever thought I was going to sell any of those at Comic Con. Like, what a dummy! <laughs> like yeah, the price it's, point. The, the it's a big ask. It's a big ask from a stranger. You know. Right. Whereas short form, do you think that's easier as a convention buy? So I do. I think it's easier. Yeah. I think it's really hard to sell long form at a Comic Con, and I. I'm saying this as a cartoonist that online via Patreon and Kickstarter, I make way more via Drive, right? So it's not mm-hmm. like I'm negating the value of long form storytelling in comics. I it's a by by virtue of my own career, it's way better for me. But I think at Comic Con, it's not an easy sell. I think it's quite hard, frankly, to sell long form to someone who's never heard of it. 
So now let's let's workshop this a bit. There's got to be a way. There's got to be a way to sell long format conventions. Uh, what uh, uh, what what would you do differently than bringing fifteen boxes of of that huge book to a convention? That you know well, what I mean. What what would you do do different than trying to sell those heavy hard covers? Well, I'll tell you what I did do last year because I had extras of them. I brought. 100, 150 copies of my previous floppy versions of Drive that were like 90 page collections, right? Yeah. And what I did was, because those were essentially burner copies now, I sold them all just cheap, $5. Like, well, if you're not willing to jump in, uh, try the $5 version and, and you get 90 pages and that's a pretty good value by most Marvel DC standards. So mm-hmm. um, try it out. And I had a lot of people, I sold out of those last year, but no one was willing to try the $50, you know, well, 15 people were, but... um but that I think is the solution is that you go either big flyer that introduces people and that's the best you can hope for because you're not going to mm-hmm. get the sale or smaller floppier version. Uh, what would be your thoughts? What, 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 would, what would you try to do? I think you're headed in, in exactly the right direction. And I almost wonder whether it wouldn't be I would I would I would expand on those two things you said. And I, I wonder how this would work. Number one, with the flyer. Uh, I would also include like a discount code where they can buy it online for a discount uh, to entice them to take that extra step because you know you're never going to – most of the flyers that they take home are getting thrown away immediately and never get looked at again. If you you have some kind of financial enticement in it for them, then they can go back and do that. And I almost wonder whether it wouldn't be – I don't know. I, 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 you'd have to do a cost benefit analysis, but I, even taking that floppy version one step further down and have almost like a pamphlet or a, uh, uh, like a comic book printed on cheaper paper and stapled, uh, that, that is just an introduction to the story. Uh, and the last page being purchasing information, either at the con- convention or online. Uh, I, I, I wonder if that would be worth the cost that yeah. it would take to do it. Yeah, so like uh, I haven't done SPX in years, but what do they call those little stapled things that they sell? Ash con- cans. Ash cans. Ash yes. cans. Yeah. You do like an ash can version? Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Exactly. And just and hand that out as a staple, as they're standing, you know, as something as they're standing there as a giveaway, and uh, and and see what the reaction well, is. What is the what's the what's the cost what's the cost per unit on an ash can? Do you know offhand? Well, it depends on if you. Uh, it depends on how you do it, but like most of those ash cans are. Uh, just done at the copier place. They're, they're Xerox. They're not color. They're black and white. They're stapled. So the 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 per cost uh, is probably just got to be ten or twenty cents. Don't you figure? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I, I I guess I was thinking of a bigger ash can. If you're if you're doing Xeroxes, if you're doing Xeroxes, you yeah, let's call it an eight page or or a, oh, or a I see, page. yes, yes, yes. So yeah, maybe maybe six to eighty cents. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Right now, there's some indie cartoonist out there that's tearing their hair out <laughs> listening to they us do going, it all the they're time. They're ninety five yeah. cents. They're ninety five <laughs> cents. <laughs> well, let's let's agree that it's under a dollar. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so if you just took that cost, I mean, maybe what you do is you sell them for a buck. If they cost you a buck, you sell them for a buck. That's very doable yeah. at Comic-Con. And you just assume that uh, a, a percentage of those sales will lead to bigger sales, uh, or as a test case anyway. I have no idea if they would lead to bigger sales. But um, I, I had a lot of people, though, um, and self-identifiably nerds at Comic-Con. They're, they're either wearing a Star Wars shirt or a Star Trek shirt or you know a NASA shirt or something. And they would stop and they would read like 40 pages of drive at the booth off in the corner. And I, would just, I would just let them. But yeah. uh, my thought was, A, it's fine. A percentage of these people are going to buy it. And they did at the show. Um, mm-hmm. But more to the point, if you've stopped and read 40 pages, when you get home, you're going to keep reading that. You're going to go find it. And one would hope, you know. Yeah, uh, I mean, God knows. Maybe there's people who are just like I'm. The- Comic Con is my library. We, you know, maybe. <laughs> but I, I feel like a percentage of those people will. There'll be some action that's beneficial to me that'll follow up on the forty pages that they read. Either they'll yeah. go become a reader online, or they will come back and buy the book. You know. Yep, and that's and that's where having at least, if not an ash can, definitely a flyer handy, so that you can make sure that you send that person off with something that they, they, they've got a chance to breadcrumb it back to you on, on the web, whether it's Instagram or your website or wherever, uh, you, you've got to, that your flyer is your best friend. 
That, that's yeah. one thing you don't want to skimp on at a big show is is making sure you got lots of flyers. I uh, I continue to use eight and a half by eleven flyers that are double side mm-hmm. printed. Um, and one side is nerdier jokes, and one side is more middle of the road. Like, oh, you're a librarian. Here's the here's you know. So depending on who I see walking by the booth, I will literally flip my wrist and it'll be like, here's the nerd side, here's the librarian side, or you know, here's yep, the yep. here's the mom with three kids side. Um, so uh I I still find the flyer to be I know a lot of people don't like doing flyers. I'm I'm pretty outgoing and gregarious at a Comic Con, so I have no problem handing a bunch of strangers flyers. Um my critique of my current flyer design is I need to put a map back to my booth and I need to put the two or three major items that they saw at the booth on the flyer. So that oh, they can remember where was that idea. booth that had the such and such book and where was that booth? You know, I, I need to do a better job of that on my flyer. I'm a big fan of having a map back to your booth at a, at a show. And I got that way by being on foot at, at a couple of shows and realizing how quickly I'd lose track of where that thing was that I liked. Right. You, I'd, I'd see something. And this happened to me in San Diego all the time. I'd see something and I'd be like, oh, that's a great uh, you know, a gift to bring home for my son. And I would be like, I, okay, I got to make sure I come back here before the end of the show. And then I would spend the rest of the weekend trying to remember where the hell I saw that thing at. And so I became a very, very quickly a big fan of putting a map of your booth placement on a flyer and also putting it, uh, putting it up online uh, that you see more and more people doing uh, so that your fans can find you, that people that just discovered you uh, can can find it on the flyer. That's a big, big plus. Yeah, so I'll give an example. I might as well give a shout out because I had never heard of them before, but I like the artwork. I was tr- I has w- walked by in the morning with my coffee, uh, a booth called uh, The Adventures of 19XX, and they have a really cool uh, early to mid-century design style in their comics. Mm-hmm. That's almost propagandistic. You know, it's like you know, put put the elbow grease into it. We can beat Hitler. That kind of a feel, you know. That, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, I, I just noted it. I was like, oh, wow, that's a really cool design. I want to come back and look at that. And honest to God, Brad, I've done Comic-Con for 20 years. I couldn't find the booth again once I lost them. I was, I was wandering yep. around like a like an old chicken <laughs> going, where's where's the where's the peckings? I don't know where to go. Uh, so, yeah, the, the ability to be able to give readers a quick and easy way back to your booth is, is key if you're going to do a flyer. So. Having passed out the last of my 5,000 flyers this weekend, I'm, I'm going to do an entirely new design um, uh, for this next show. So that's, that's a bit of a learning one. But anyway, yeah. um, my big takeaway from Comic-Con, and you and I have talked about this for the last couple of years, is that for the average person coming to Comic-Con, you have to realize the show is no longer about comics. It hasn't been for a while. Um, mm-hmm. It's a part of the show, but to me... What Comic-Con is, if you're going to do it and you've never done it before, is Comic-Con is about the experience for most people. Yes. And when you internalize that, that it's about the experience, it's not necessarily about your book, that can actually help you sell your book to people who are there for the experience. And here's what I mean by that. Okay, so I will give you an example. So I spent X amount of dollars buying my booth, getting all the promotional materials for my booth, all the book stands, all the all the tablecloths, all the all the stuff that you need for a Comic Con, right? That was my uh-huh. budget, but I spent that hoping to make that back plus plus a profit, right? So that that was my hope for Comic Con. In the meantime, thirty booths over, Fox had a booth that they probably spent a half million dollars on for Deadpool. That served no purpose. <laughs> it served no purpose in terms of helping the overall profit of Deadpool, other than to show an animatronic Deadpool dancing with the singing cast of a Chuck E. Cheese pizza place called Showtime Pizza that used to exist. <laughs> I remember Showtime. Yeah, you remember Showtime Pizza? They, yeah. uh, uh, by the way, excellent documentary on what happened to Showtime. Uh, look for it on Netflix or Hulu. I don't know oh, where it is. Really? But, uh, yeah. Oh, it's uh, Brad, it's amazing. You've got to watch this documentary. I- I love those documentaries. God, this one I get is, sucked right into them. Uh, having made a documentary myself, I got to tell you, this is a low-budget documentary that really brings it home. They did a great job. Um, oh, I can't wait. So definitely look for that one. Anyway, they Fox built a whole stage that's just an animatronic Deadpool singing, um, working nine to five with the Showtime pizza players. <laughs> And the gorilla and the bear, they're all dressed up in X-Men outfits. It's the funniest thing, right? It's, it's, oh, my God. It builds the brand of, of Deadpool, no doubt at all. But what right. I'm getting at is 
they are building an experience, Fox is, so that you remember Deadpool mm-hmm. and so that you and I do exactly what we're doing right now, which is to talk about Deadpool, right? Right. Like that right. booth did what it was supposed to do, but the goal was to create an experience that you talk about, not to sell you an item, not to make a profit on that booth. Right. And, and this is what I'm getting at in terms of Comic-Con is once you realize that most of the booths at Comic-Con are there to provide you with an experience as a fan or as a reader so that you don't you go back and either buy or get the DVD or go stream Star Wars or buy a video game or whatever somewhere else. Yeah. That's a very different thing than a cartoonist going to a show and saying, buy my book, buy my book, buy my right. book. You know, that's a very right. different purpose for that booth. And so, it's jarring for somebody who, you know, again, if you, I'm really kind of getting into what you're saying, and that is the person walking out there is there for the experience, and all of a sudden you're jarring them into another reality when you're trying to turn it into a shopping trip. Yes, that's exactly it. So yeah. here comes a family of four walking by your booth. They've just got to sit for free and watch a half million dollar uh, Deadpool exhibit sing to them. Then they went to, <laughs> then they walked past the Dark Horse booth and got a free bag handed to them with three Dark Horse comics inside of it. Yeah. Then they yep. walked by ABC and got a free poster tube with a free poster inside of it. And then they get yep. to Dave Kellett and I'm going, hey, how are you? Have you tried Drive? Yeah, Wait, would you, exactly. Would you like and to buy like, Drive? What the hell? What are you going to give me? And, yeah, and how exactly. many times do we have people come up to our tables and say, uh, and, and just pick up a book and walk away? And it's like, oh, I thought that you're, I thought you were giving these away. And of course, we look at them like they've got snakes coming out of their nose, but it, it's it's actually not not only forgivable, it, it's actually us who is maybe out of step with what the expectations are, right? Right. We are the odd men out increasingly at Comic-Con. Yeah. There's yeah. about, out of the hundred or so rows or whatever it is, there's maybe 15, 20 rows that are trying to sell you comics. And the other ones right. are all trying to sell you an experience so that you go and buy the or partake of that product somewhere else, you know? So now, how, it, so wait a minute, Dave, how do you, how are you, how do you tell me that you made three times your expenditure? Uh, you didn't do that. Uh, uh, how do you, how do you do that? You didn't do that all through experiences, did you? Uh, yes. I offer everybody a warm and reassuring hug for $5. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and Brad, that's, that's you, having been on the receiving end of that, that's worth it. I was going to say, you've been on the receiving end of more than a few uh, lingering oh, yeah. Dave Kellett hugs. And uh, no. I got to tell you, that's worth the $5. That's... That... <laughs> I just, at one point, just handed you my credit card. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Don't ask where I ran it. That's the, that's just, <laughs> uh, that. but you know, you get what you pay for in terms of hugs. And I, uh, that's I right. uh, it's an experience. It's a, I don't want to say IMAX, but it's, it's an experience. Yeah, you maxed it right out, as I remember. But anyway, <laughs> a short trip to Mexico, and I was right back. Um, but no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't mean to sound sarcastic. I'm trying to get my head around this. How do I survive in that cre- in that ex- uh, uh, in that environment of everybody else is offering experiences as an artist? What kind of experience can I possibly offer? Okay, so here are my three takeaways. Uh, no, four takeaways that you can do at Comic-Con, right? For for mm-hmm. working within an environment that is, for most people, an experience, not a purchasing moment. Yeah. So, uh, option number, so point number one, your fans will be there, and the fans that will be there will be your super fans. So you want to sell to them with exclusives and with sketches and with all that sort of stuff. And frankly, with friendship, you're genuinely thankful that they're there. I am anyway. And it's fun to catch up with them. And they are incredibly supportive. And they will buy my original art because I'm going to sign it in person. They'll buy a book because I'll sketch in it in person. They'll buy exclusives because they know from my website that they exist only on at the at the show and not at the at the site. So that's number one. That for me is a really big core audience. And frankly, those are the people that I come to serve. Like, Right. That's the audience that I want to nurture right there. In many respects, some of those are relationships that fans I've been I've been talking to and selling to and and sketching for for 10 years. And so it's a lovely thing to nurture. So that's that's the core. Right. For me anyway. Yeah. Then the second one are people who, even though they didn't come to buy a comic book, they're like, hey, this looks interesting. What what is this? What's anatomy of animals? And then I explained to him, oh, it's a spoof on 
biology books, but we make fun of different animals as though they're personalities. And they start reading it and they start laughing and they show it to their their boyfriend or their or their wife or whatever it is. And then mm-hmm. they um they buy it, right? So that's number two. They didn't know they were coming for a book, but they're gonna buy a book. And oh by the way, there's a free sketch with it. Oh great, how nice. Oh, and here's a flyer and you can check out my comics when you get home. Oh nice, lovely, nice to meet you. Enjoy the show. Buddy body boom, you're done, right? Yeah. Yeah. So those are the two core audiences for whom um I'm I'm uh selling. And then the third one is uh, the experience. Uh, and this one, I will give credit where credit is due. Jake Parker and, and Sam uh, Logan of <laughs> Sam and Fuzzy do this uh-huh. amazingly, which is part of why you would go to Comic-Con to get an experience is that there might be artists there. So, oh, yeah. look at here's some artists where you could pay them to create something for you while you watch. Oh, that's interesting. Right. Hey, kids, come over here. Mommy's going to pay $40 and have uh, Mr. Sam Logan draw our dog. This is fun. Or, oh, hey, guys, come over here. Look at Mr. Here's Mr. Jake Parker, and he's going to draw Spider-Man as a robot for us. And and look at that. Isn't that fun? And that's an experience. You know, you can make a request of an, arti- uh, of an artist, pass them some money, yeah. and watch while they create what you've asked for. Um, that is an absolute Comic-Con experience for some families. And uh, Jake and Sam, to their credit, and me to a smaller extent, um, uh, make that part of our routine, and it's fun because uh, you're basically a dancing monkey. But it's a you're, it's fun to be a dancing monkey for a cartoonist that's mostly in their own studio by themselves. Um, yeah. And so that's the third one. And then the fourth one is I forgot, Brad. I was talking one through three, and I forgot what the fourth one was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm over here sitting on tenter hooks trying to figure out what number four could be. Oh well, I guess number four. I, maybe this was it. I don't remember if this was it. The fourth one, I think, is uh, sell to people for down the road. And what I mean by that is the flyers, the people that read forty pages of Drive, um, the agents that you talk to, the uh, potential jobs for down the road. That's also what makes Comic-Con worth it. So you're building yeah. leads for down the road. Um, that's another big one that I do at Comic-Con. You're planting seeds. Planting so seeds. I, that's a better way to say it. Yes, good. Yeah. I like this idea of selling a sketch as an experience. I really like what you're saying there. Well, you know me that I had always made a big selling point that like any book that you buy from me at Comic-Con or frankly, any book that you bring to Comic-Con that you've already bought, I will put a sketch in it. Because for right. me, that was part of cementing the relationship of like, you and I have met, here's here's a fun memento of the moment that you can show to friends. And and frankly, uh, we've cemented our relationship and great, how lovely, right? But right. Sam Logan and Jake Parker and Laura D'Souza and others take it to the next level where they say, not only do we meet, and I'm yes, I can give you a quick sketch, but if you'd like a really good illustrated uh, creation that I take some time on and craft, then that'll be yeah. $40. That'll be $200. That'll be $300, whatever, whatever right. level you agree on for the, you know, complexity of the sketch. And a lot of people really like that. Um, that's for comic super fans. They come to Comic-Con and they, you know, they go around and look for Neil Adams or look for, uh, you know, think of anybody you can think of, uh, uh cartoonist wise, and they, they look for them and, and buy their sketches or, or commission sketches. So, um, well, and so, I know, I know, I know Jake does this, that, that kind of builds off of that in terms of having the more elaborate illustration. Uh, cause I saw him, uh, uh, talking about it on social media. Uh, he takes pre-show commissions so that if people say, I want you to draw this, that, and the next, he can do it uh, at his studio on the, on the weeks coming up to the convention in good conditions. And then, uh, present that to the person in person at the show. Right. Right. Well, and which that's I what, think is a great idea. That's what I, Beth and I did for this show was I did said you, really? you can either buy a $150, $250 line art illustration from me and I will get it done early. Or you could buy a $250 to $300 watercolored line art commission from me. And I would do that. Beth and I would do that early and we would bring them to the show. And so what was really fun is you can spend some time on it in down moments and get it done. And then you still have the personal experience of picking it up from the artist at the show. And for me, it, God, it was lovely to see families' reactions. There was one family, the Ramirez family, <laughs> I'm going to remember them. They had, I wish I had videotaped it because that moment as a marketing moment was amazing. Their reaction was adorable and so yeah. fun and so genuine. And it was such a real bonding moment between uh, artists and audience. And they were happy and I was happy. And uh, they loved their commission and, uh, it was great. I wish I would have videotaped it, but anyway, 
Um, the idea that you can get it done from home or at night uh, after Comic-Con is over and bring it in the next day, that's a great way to work it. Uh, so there's mm -hmm. the Sam Logan model, which is I will do it for you for $40 right in front of you. Or there's the the Jake Parker model, which is I'll do it for hundreds and I'll take it home and work on it. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's a great idea. And if and, and, and it's also a good way to kind of build up buzz before the show. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's great. Uh, so that uh, commissions alone, um, the pre-show commissions alone uh, added $1,000 to my Comic-Con. So I can't recommend that. Wow. That, that was great. That, that was well worth doing. Um, and then and did I see on some of the stuff you were posting that Beth was coloring them as well? Yeah, and I I make it very clear that uh, uh, that you're getting – frankly, you're getting a far better colorist by having Beth do it than I'm doing it. Um, yeah. So that's uh, that's how we did that one. Yeah, it was, it was good. Um, she does the for those. Now, what did know, she use to color it? What's that? What did she use? A color uh, pencil. Color. We uh, really. I, I normally would draw on Bristol, but in this case, yeah. we found through some light experimentation in the last few months that water uh, Bristol is not great for watercolors. So yeah. um, we got some. Uh, I don't know if it was cold press or hard press uh, watercolor paper, and we've been doing some of the commissions on that, and it looks great. It looks amazing. That's nice. But um, what else? Oh, there's so much to talk about. For uh, Okay, so my big takeaway for you and me is I want there to be a Comic Lab panel at San Diego Comic-Con in like two or three years. I want to grow this show, oh. and I, I, I want to I have fun and have you at the Comic-Con, uh, Brad. That's, that, what, that's my goal. A, a Comic Lab panel at San Diego would actually get me on a plane. <laughs> would it? Oh, great. That I, that I think I'd come out for. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I just thought that would be a fun one to do at that show. Yeah, that's something I definitely miss is the panels that we used to do together. Uh, that was some of the most fun because because uh, you can go. It, it's the same as doing a podcast, but you can hear people reacting to what you're saying. And uh, and, and those were some of the some of my best uh, loved moments uh, was doing pot. It was doing panels with you guys. Yeah, it was really, really fun. I we could record a live uh, comic lab from the and take live questions. That would be super fun. Oh, um, yeah. So I wanted, that's my goal. And also, Brad, because my Swiss cheese memory, I just remember what point number four was <laughs> from earlier. Not that one you made up on the spot. You got a number, <laughs> you got another number four? Well, now I got a number five, I guess. Oh, Look at I'll, me. Well, good. I'll take a number five. I'm Let's a hear font, it. I am a font of information, Brad. That's what I am. Uh, yes. You know, you know what it is? There's just so many thoughts coming out of this Comic-Con that I want to talk to you about that there's, they're coming fast and furious. And so I forgot I one. I can tell. I so can tell. The, okay. So the other thing, the, the fifth point now about selling to the experience of comic-con is yeah um you have to recognize at an art as an artist and this is not true for like um des moines regional dragon con 2018 <laughs> like that this is not what i'm talking about i'm talking about right. the big shows like new york comic-con san diego comic-con maybe emerald city mm -hmm. comic-con maybe even a tcaf or something like that um yeah. what you have to realize is is there's a percentage of people that go there and then love the experience and it's super fun but the guilt creeps in about their girlfriend that couldn't come or the one son that couldn't make it or yep. the husband that had to work uh, that weekend and so couldn't come. And so there's a lot of purchases at a big show that are guilt purchases. And yeah. what I mean by that is like, oh, Susan couldn't come because she had that extra shift this weekend at the hospital. So <laughs> let's get her a book. Oh, Susan loves animals. Let's get her this book. Or, oh, Susan, yeah. uh, she'd love a sketch of, of her, you know, of her, I don't know, whatever, fish. Uh, I'm just saying. Yeah. So, so many purchases at Comic-Con are guilt purchases for the person that couldn't go to Comic-Con. And you as a cartoonist yeah. can play to that if you, if you think about ways to do whatever it is in your genre or whatever it is in your body of work that can be used to sell to someone uh, that's not there, uh, you can play to that. So that was my well, fifth point, Brad. That's where your pug books particularly are so powerful because I've seen people come up uh, time and time again when I used to exhibit with you, uh, and they weren't necessarily Sheldon fans, they weren't necessarily Drive fans, but they'd see that pug on the cover and they'd be drawn to it like a magnet and the neat thing about that is you can buy that book for anyone who's got a, a pet or anyone who happens to have a dog, especially if they've got a pug. But it, 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 it's the perfect gift book. And I could see if you are going to do a convention, 
making sure that you've got your something on your table that's not necessarily specific to you or your niche or your title, but something that can be used as a gift to somebody that's got a broad appeal, and you're going to do real well. And then what happened uh, at time and time and year after year after year, those people that had no idea who you were came up and bought a pug book as a gift, came back because lo and behold, they became Sheldon readers over the past year because that's how they gained entry into your world. And now they're here for the rest of the damn book. That You know what? That very thing happened this year on Thursday where someone yeah. came up and the husband and wife, they said, we bought your uh, the last of your pug books last year and we loved it and we'd like to get uh, uh, another one of your books. And then they looked at all the books that I had and they bought one of each. And Brad, oh, it was like a two hundred and eighty dollars purchase just coming up from that. I so, love, I love when that happens. When somebody comes up and buys the entire run of Evil Link, it's the best feeling in the world. You just want to reach out and hug them. Yeah, and that's why I don't even charge for the hug at that point. I'm just uh, <laughs> no, you're giving that one away for I'm, free. Yeah, I, I give the I give the milk away for free. To heck with buying the cow. <laughs> oh yeah, I love that feeling. Oh, but geez, Brad, I have so much I want to talk to you about, though, about the show. There, there, I, 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 sorry, I'm now like an excited little kid. Yeah. Oh, Brad, there was ice cream and there's a roller coaster. Oh, and I got to meet Mickey Mouse. Oh, man. <laughs> um, so uh, the one thing that I wanted to talk to you about is you and I in the past have talked about Instagram as a growing platform for comics, right? Yeah. And I grew Instagram as fast as I could to whatever level it was, 10,000, whatever level lets you link away from Instagram. Yeah. And everybody listening can can immediately know the value in being able to link away from a platform to say, hey, did you like this? Go buy it. That kind of right, thing. Right. Right. So I very quickly built up to to Instagram to whatever level that was and then kind of let it lie fallow and have just been posting comics on Instagram. I do like the format very, very much on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I like the panel by panel sliding, uh, all sorts of stuff. Um, I had because uh, not everybody's going to say it. I had possibly a dozen to two dozen people come up and buy something saying, oh, I just started reading you on Instagram. And to me, that was such a big uh, light bulb moment of, oh, it's working. Yeah. Because uh, I really had never had, aside from being able to link away from something, I really had never had um, big moments of like, oh, yeah, the Instagram stuff was worth putting the time in. Whereas right here, right in front of me, there was probably 200 to $500 worth of sales from Instagram. And so mm -hmm. um, I just want to say for whatever that's worth, uh, in a non-scientific way, I did have a lot of noticeable sales from Instagram at Comic-Con. So um, for those of you that are on the fence about it, I think it, it's probably worthwhile to, uh, to start posting on Instagram. So did you do any outreach on Instagram about the show as the show was coming up? I did. For the first time that I had ever done it on Instagram, I had my face on there saying like, hey, as a post, like, hey, here I go. I'm going to be at Comic-Con. And then uh, <laughs> I had a couple specialized posts saying, hey, not only will I be at Comic-Con, but here's all the here's where my booth is. Here's right. where all my exclusives are. Like over six or seven tiles, that kind of thing. And then yes. over the last two comics that ran, I don't know, Wednesday or Friday of Comic-Con, it would be panel one, panel two, panel three. Advertising for Comic Con, advertising for Comic Con. You get the idea. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. You're, by the way, I enjoyed your Galactus World Eater comic. Oh, the one I <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> My favorite is uh, every once in a while you get a moron that will explain the joke to you, yeah. and uh, I I love it when people are like. So the, the joke for people at home was Galactus World Eater. That was panel one. Panel two was he's checking a weight loss app, and panel three just have him has him in front of a, a tiny sad little uh, planet, and it says Forest Moon. Right, that's the joke. It yeah. works better visually. Uh, but I loved that the people would come up to me uh, on either an Instagram or in person and go, I get it. Forest Moon is like a salad. <laughs> Brad, Brad, Forest Moon is like a salad. I'd be like, get yep, it. you figured it's, it out. It's got a lot of green. Yep. Good job, champ. You, you uh, Thank you, Sherlock, for explaining my jokes to me. I, I want to say I see why the London police keep you on retainer, uh, Sherlock. You're doing a great job over there. <laughs> Save an Instagram one comment at a time. Good job. It, it, it's nice that people are are willing to come up and explain your humor to you. But what is that impulse? That's weird. Uh, that's a weird impulse to explain a joke to someone, especially the person that made it. 
Yeah, yeah. That well, uh, listen. <laughs> we ha- having done conventions for a long time, we know that there's a, there's an th- th- this thing attracts an awful lot of people for whom social interaction maybe isn't the uh, the, the, the the strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> Not what they're known for. Oh, Greg, he's he's real good at the socializing, that Greg. Oh, he's going to Comic-Con. Oh, how interesting. <laughs> Not exactly the wheelhouse, exactly. <laughs> right. Well, let me ask you a question about that relatedly. Yeah. Uh, so you you have a wonderful phrase of booth barnacles uh, that yes. you've used for 15, 20 years. Yeah, uh, I don't know if that's not. Is that a phrase you came up with or is that just one that I got from you? It is. It is the one thing I, I, when I finally pass on, there's not going to be a lot to say about me, except you will be able to say that I coined that term that everybody uses now, Booth Barnacle. It goes all the way back to a Greystone Inn comic that I made. I, maybe I think the first or second year that I did San Diego, I did a bunch of strips about San Diego and I and I coined that term. But yeah. I, you can, there are, it, it, I have been able to find no uses of that term before that. So be prepared to put that on my O bit that I coined that term. Well, first of all, a doff of the cap to you, sir, from Los yes. Angeles, because I think the phrase <laughs> booth barnacles is amazing. Uh, <laughs> second of all, for our younger listeners or people who have not yet gone to a Comic Con, can you explain to them what the concept of a booth barnacle is? Oh, that's real easy. A, birth, a booth barnacle is somebody that comes up to your table and st- and overstays their welcome. And, 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 and that's, that's the key point is you, you've, that person has overstayed and, and that amount of time, it it might be different for different situations and different people. Uh, but they, they are unable to realize that, uh, their time is up and move on. And as a result, they just kind of plant themselves on, uh, at the front of your booth in some cases, making it hard for you to interact with other people who might be coming up, or in some cases, just uh, making it impossible for you to take a few moments and decompress and enjoy the lulls that happen as they happen and kind of regroup your your mental uh, uh, footing. Uh, but 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 some of the some of the key. Uh, parts of this is number one, overstaying your welcome, and number two, just not not having it, 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 real, it, not being able to realize that you've long since gone into a one sided conversation, and the person is not responding uh, uh, an, an awful lot. Do I, do, am I missing uh, any key elements there? <laughs> no, you're not. The <laughs> the to me, the most extreme version of a booth barnacle is yes. uh, talk 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 talk. And then you're like, well, thanks so much for coming, right? You give yeah. you give the universal uh, uh, audio cue of, yeah. okay, this has been nice. Let's move it along. Right. And then they don't move or, <laughs> this is the worst, they go absolutely silent and st- continue to stand staring at you smilingly <laughs> <laughs> with like this awkward, you're like, uh, am I expected to lead the conversation now that I've tried to exit? What's happening? <laughs> Yeah, and they they don't pick up the social cue, and 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 we had a whole t- <laughs> we had a whole routine uh, that we used to do uh, uh, to kind of talk about this. But you you start with well, thanks for coming out. It was great to see you, and then they and then they stay, and then you shake their hand. Remember that that's the next step. That that that's an additional social cue. It's like a handshake usually happens at the beginning and at the end of an yeah. interaction. Yeah. So now you shake their hand. Hey, thanks again for coming on. I I know I can't keep you. There's another little hint. I know I can't keep you here. There's lots of show, <laughs> lots of show for you to go out and see. I don't want to hold you up. And then they stay. And then you do the 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 patented. Uh, I don't know which one of us. It was you. It was absolutely you because I'm so thankful to you for inventing it. <laughs> but then what you do is you 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 give them one more cue, one more verbal cue. Thanks so much for coming out. You shake their hand and then you pat them with your opposite hand. You pat them on the shoulder and with the third pat, you just give a little push. And I <laughs> <laughs> and I've actually had because <laughs> once you get the inert the inertia going. Once they've got it, you, you get them to kind of stumble and, and move their weight. Now they've got inertia and they just float away. <laughs> it's funny because 
it's not like you're trying to pull a true asshole move like Trump trying to handshake a world right, leader. Right, right, You're just giving like two to four pounds of pressure on their shoulder, just enough to remind them that like, oh, moving is a possible choice at this point. Yes, you know, just it, it's got to be gentle, like a butterfly kiss on their shoulder because yeah, you don't exactly. want you don't or, want to actually push. But there's no other better verb for it. But you just give them a little, little, little gentle persuasion. Although I do, I do remember one Comic Con being next to you, and there was someone that was not getting the hit. So you went back in again, yeah. and you not only did the shoulder push, but you did maybe five pounds of pressure pulling with the hand that was shaking. So yeah. their leg absolutely turned by just by Brad applying like 10, 15 pounds of pressure. He did a, he did a push pull and it was the most amazing move oh. I've ever seen. Cause this guy had been here for like 45 minutes and you have oh, to understand yeah. at a comic con that's interminable. I mean, that's yeah. when you're, when you're longer than most episodes of television, it's time to go, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> so what do you, what do you think? Okay. Now let's, let, let's, let's, uh, let's try to quantify this. What do you think is an acceptable amount of time for somebody to be in front of your table? I think if it goes over 20 minutes, that's that, that then you've overstayed 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Well, 20, 20 minutes. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> God bless you, Brad Geiger for giving 20 minutes to your fellow man and women, but that's ridiculous. <laughs> no. What do you think the what do you think the general time frame for a visit should be? God, Brad, 20 minutes. Sorry, I'm still on that. Uh no. My, okay, if it's sketching, it goes as long as the sketch. So right, you close right. the book, you hand it to them, you say, Thanks so much for coming, because you've been talking to them that whole time, ideally. Yes. Uh, don't don't go quiet when you're in sketching. Ask them, just ask them about Comic Con and then let them talk. Cause then they feel yeah. like they've had a nice moment. It's it, it's also fun to hear about Comic Con, all the things that you're not be, getting able to experience. So you say, like, what's the most fun thing you've done at Comic Con so far? Or yeah, you know, it does, uh, it's how many not been... hard to keep a conversation going while you're sketching. You do, you don't have to do that much. All you have right. to do is ask leading questions and then and then, re, you know, respond to it or do that old, you know, psychology trick where you take the last thing they say and you repeat it to them in the form of a question. <laughs> right. You know, like right, they right. say, oh, you know what? The, the, the neatest thing I saw was Deadpool over there with the Showtime Pizza animatronics. And then you go Showtime Pizza animatronics. <laughs> and then and then they take I mean, off from there. All you got to do is take those last few sentences or or a few words, make it into a sentence and you can you can keep a conversation going without really doing a whole lot of mental checking in and you can work on your uh, focusing on your sketch. Focusing on your sketch. It's focusing. Yeah, you're you're sketching and and talking. <laughs> What did I, I say? did it to you? I just did it to you. <laughs> oh my god, that was you're really good at this. Oh my god, that was that was the greatest thing I've ever done. You didn't even notice that I was doing it while you were explaining it. No. <laughs> oh my god. All, all you to Brad's point, all you have to do is lilt your voice a little bit and end it in that in, edit in that Englishism of you know a, a question where you go a little high at the end. Oh my god, that's great! So anyway, wow, that was amazing. Ah, uh, that was amazing. Um, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cherish that one to my grave. Oh, I remember the time I got Brad while he was explaining the concept. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm still enjoying that. Um, so. Anyway, to, to get to back to your earlier point, um, <laughs> if it, you go as long as the sketch is and then you close the book, you hand it to him and it's an immediate strong hand out shake out, out, out extended. Thanks so yeah. much for coming by. God, it was really fun to talk to you. Because, by the way, all of that is genuine. It was right. really fun to talk to them. It was really fun to sketch for them. You're thankful that you bought the book and have a great Comic Con. None of this is live, by the way. I'm just telling you what I do. Right. Um, and then. Uh, if there's just a book purchased or someone coming by to say hi again, uh uh, 30 seconds to a minute like that's socially not, yeah. there's nothing else that needs to be done there um and then really if it goes past five minutes i'm at that point doing uh, the whole series of normal social cues of like well it's been really nice talking to you or yeah uh, gosh i don't want to hold you up or i hope you enjoy the show the rest of the show or and then if it gets really bad then you have to bring out the big guns which is normally in human interaction, you would physically move your body away. You would say, hey, thanks yeah. so much. Uh, I've got to go over here now. <laughs> you know, whatever you would yeah, do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I, my wife is calling me. I got to go over there and talk to her. One of the reasons why Comic-Con gets awkward for people who are not particularly well 
socialized is that you can't give the greatest social cue of all, which is to walk away. Right. So because you are still standing there, they are still standing there. Do you know what I mean, Brad? Yep. Yep. Like yep. that's that's the the big gun can never be brought out because you can't use it at a Comic Con. So, um, uh, and also let's let's come at this from the most basic point. They have been reading you for for years, sometimes decades, and they're excited to talk to you. And yes. and God bless them; they should be. It's really fun. I get excited when I get to meet people that I read. Um, but what's odd about it is sometimes people misinterpret their reading for friendship or for a relationship. You know what I mean? Right, right, and, right. And that's where it gets awkward because I've been there too. Like if I could meet Douglas Adams right now, I'd be like, oh, I know everything about you. You know, and yep. that's. But he doesn't know anything about me, so it's not a it's not a two way street. And so I would be like, anyway, thank you, Mr. Adams. This has been a lovely one minute talking to you. Have a good day, that kind of thing. You know, right. you you got to know to cut it off. Um, and so sometimes people's genuine excitement gets ahead of their normal socialization skills, and they just keep talking. You know, yeah. Um, anyway, if it gets to that point, Brad, after about at the five minute point, I start breaking eye contact. Like I'm either rearranging something in my booth oh. or, or you know, and that kind of thing. Still or answering. Go- or go behind the screen or, or, you know, like you and I used to take that, uh, used to take that end cap and I see you still do it. You put the banner diagonally and then you've got the V shaped table out in front of you. And then you've got a triangle of space behind the banner that you can pile up books and your stock and you can go back there and grab a sandwich if you want to, without being stared at. And that's when I would usually go like behind the screen and say, oh, excuse me, I've got to go, uh, you know, make something up. I, I'm I'm, I'm going to take a quick lunch break here. I'm starving, blah, blah, and go behind the screen and just sit for a little while. And right. hope they wander away. Uh, Dave, Dave, can we can we talk about one of the most brilliant methods that we had? That oh, is it the phone call? The, yes. <laughs> Yes. All right. Do you want to explain it or do you want me to explain it? Well, you know, it was your idea. You do the honors. All right. So there was a particular Emerald City Comic Con where, for whatever reason, and with all of the best intentions that come with people's hearts, Brad and I both ended up with like two booth barnacles. And another thing, another big one to know is, are you going back every day oh, at Comic Con? Yeah. Yeah. Are you, are you that's returning another one that's for another an little... extended conversation? Yeah. yeah that's Stopping little... by and saying, oh, hey, uh, you know, I'm back for Saturday. I'm, I'm really excited. I get to see this person, that person. Hey, fantastic. Go out there. Have a good time. Uh, that's great. We love that. That's good. You come back and again, just a few seconds, little, little, little something there. Uh, but if if you're lingering on and on, then you've got to realize that 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 artist or that creator you're talking to has other things that they need to get to. But they, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. And it's not even again to re, to reemphasize the, the, the basic human interaction there is that this is an artist that's paid thousands usually to come to a Comic-Con. And yeah. so to your you're taking. At that point, you're you're then diminishing their ability to. I mean, it's not what people. Everyone already knows this. That's listening, but um, anyway, <laughs> Brad and I had an Emerald City Comic Con where we had both of us two uh, very kind, enthusiastic readers that kept coming back and kept yes. staying for a half an hour or forty five minutes. And this was over multiple days. So, like on day two or three, I said, "Brad, I got an idea." And I go, uh, I'm going to Google search an image of an old man sitting in a, in a, in a recliner chair. And he goes, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> and I changed Brad's contact photo so that when Brad called me, it would be this old man, like holding up a coffee as a toast in an armchair with like a cat on his lap. Right. Yes. And then I changed Brad's name on my contacts list to grandpa, grandpa Bubbins or whatever it was. Right. Or just say grandpa. <laughs> And so if I was in minute 30 of a of a conversation that I could not escape from with a booth barnacle, just someone like, and then my cat Giggles knocked over all the cereal and I and you're like, what's going on here? Brad would Brad would very kindly and discreetly step back in the booth, turn around yep. and call me and then just hold his phone at his side. Yep. And I would get I'd be like, oh. Wait, I'm getting some kind of phone call. Oh, God, it's my grandpa Bubbins. Oh, look. And you'd kind of hold the photo out to be like, yep, that's my yep. grandpa Bubbins. <laughs> and 
<laughs> you would be like, I, you know what? It's been so lovely talking to you. He, this was this is a, a tricky moment for him. Can I take this phone call? Thank you for coming by. Oh yeah, of course. Bye. <laughs> yeah, he's he's ninety years old. God only knows how many phone calls I'm going to have. With yeah, I've got to take know? this call. I'm sorry at Comic Con. I've got to take this call. And then you would step away and you'd be like, Grandpa Bubbins. Oh, it's lovely to hear you. Uh, you know. And then you turn around in the booth and you take the call, right? And then Brad would yeah. keep telling and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> but the amazing one that we had, Brad had a booth, <laughs> booth particle. And so I turn around and I call Brad and Brad yeah. goes, oh, look, it's my grandma, Grandma Susan. Oh, God bless her. She's calling right now. I've got to take this call. Do you mind? And yeah. the person goes, no, not at all. And so Brad takes the call and he's doing like two, three minutes of vamping. Like, yes, of course, we'll come out for Christmas. Oh, we'd love to see you. Of course. He's doing all this and he's going and going and going and going. And then he does the pretend phone hang up and turns back around. Booth Barnacle is still there <laughs> waiting for Brad. And now and the not, Barnacle wants to know how Grandma's doing. Yeah, and that spurred a whole other car. And then we had no backup. Like that, for Brad and I, that was yeah. our nuclear bomb. We had that nothing was past it. that. <laughs> we had done we had done everything we could do at that point you're just you're just screwed you're you're gonna, I still you're remember gonna have this, there, this was like 15 12 15 years ago the the worst one i'd ever seen was the only the only bigger gun bigger than that that and chris straub used it was he said you know what i've got to go use the restroom anyway lovely talking to you have a great day Chris legitimately goes, uses the restroom, takes a couple minutes, comes back, Booth Barnacle's still there, still <laughs> it's like there. waiting for Chris Ooh. to come back. And you're like, oh, God, this is so <laughs> awkward. What do we do? Now, we should have this talk. We should, we should stop for a moment uh, because every time we've done this conversation in the past uh, or, or handled this topic, uh, somebody comes up to us later on in the show or somebody writes an email or tweets us and says, Oh my God, was I that person? Right. Let me tell you unequivocally, just we're going to take a little, we've had a very funny chat here. Let me tell you, if you have any inkling that you might've been that person, then you're not that person. Ah, uh, that's the perfect I way to summarize that. Because yes. I guarantee you that the people we're talking about are, 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 are so... I, I don't, they're missing the cues to such an extent that they don't know that even if we told them that they're this person, they wouldn't really get that they're this person. And there it's, 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 it's falls into that Dunning Krager kind of zone of they, they, they are just not picking up on this. So if you're listening to us right now and you think that you might've been that person, don't worry about it. You weren't. Yeah. It's, it, you hit it perfectly. It's, it's very much Dunning Kruger of like, they don't yeah. know what they don't know in terms of socialization. So <laughs> yeah. it's, they're it's, not the ones that are going to be like, gosh, was that me? If you are even having the thought in your heart, Brad said it perfectly that like, yeah. oh, was I, was I a barnacle? I hope I wasn't. Then no, it wasn't you because you have the empathy and the sympathy to go like, all right, no, it's been two minutes time for me to move on. And so that's what <laughs> yeah. happened. I'm sure <laughs> you were not a barnacle. Yes. Um, uh, it, it is unfortunate to talk about this in a public way because it's sort of a fun shared moment for all cartoonists or anyone yes. that has ever had to work a booth. But um, I don't want you to think, too, as, as a listener, that this is 99.9% .9 of people are lovely, wonderful to talk to. The energy is great. The exchange is fun. It's literally fun for car. As my wife says, explaining to me why I like Comic-Con, she uh -huh. says, Dave, People come up to you, they give you a $20 bill, they tell you how wonderful you are, and then they walk away. Why wouldn't you love Comic-Con? <laughs> yeah. it's, it's the closest I'm ever going to know what it's to be like a stripper. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is not the way I was going to take that, but all right, thank you. Uh, anyway... Um, I love and they have they have a much better way of handling barnacles. They just call over Tony and Tony's, you know, six foot four, 400 pounds, has no neck and he handles you. Yeah. Tony's arm is as big as you are. Uh, yeah. So um, anyway, I love Comic-Con because ninety nine point nine percent of my human interactions are legitimately delightful. I come mm -hmm. back from Comic-Con mm -hmm. energized. I come back from Comic-Con inspired. I I hold on to those moments, those wonderful moments and those conversations all year long because yeah. I like you remember that family that I was talking about that I revealed the commission to? I'm uh -huh. going to hold on to their faces for weeks cuz that's fantastic. Oh, yeah. That's like a, a hit of serotonin whenever I need it uh in terms of feeling great about my cartooning. 
So I love Comic-Con. I love the interaction. I genuinely love the conversation. So please don't ever be afraid to come talk to Brad or I or any other cartoonist right. you love to. It's uh, This is a very specific, small subset of human beings who, exactly. not just at Comic-Con, probably in a chunk of their life, they just have trouble um, picking up on social cues. And as best we can, I want you to know, Brad and I, we've we've laid out the worst case scenarios for how we handle it. But also, the majority of the time, it's with kindness and love that we usher them through the conversation, and then we eventually yep. figure out a way to, to duck out of it. But it's not like we're immediately breaking out the phone going, oh, Grandpa Biggins, <laughs> you know, like whatever it is. <laughs> Yeah, that 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 was a that was a unique experience. But yeah, yeah. I can I can hear the excitement in in your voice talking to you today. I mean, you are you are still on cloud nine. This is Tuesday. Uh, uh, Comic Con ended Sunday evening, and you're still kind of riding high from it. It's oh, it's yeah. it's fun I, to listen to. Well, cartoonists that say like, oh, why do you still do Comic Con? Why why do you still go? I get it you mean, because you like, mean cartoonists I would go to like me. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not I'm not putting it on you. I'm just saying that there's a lot of cartoonists like, boy, good luck to my friends at Comic Con. Boy, what a yeah. shithole. That is like <laughs> I I get it and I understand why they feel that way. But for yeah. me, I get a genuine, genuine charge out of San Diego Comic Con. I love it. I love going to it. I love being there for five days. If I could transport myself there right now, I'm not joking, transport that myself right now to a monday tuesday of comic-con i would do it i love it i think it's so fun yeah. um do i get tired absolutely uh, do i get more tired this year because <laughs> daddy's a little chunky this year absolutely <laughs> um <laughs> but uh i love being able to meet and talk to people i love hearing kind words i love hearing what storylines resonated with them or what they love about my comics in a way that you don't get from an email you know which yeah. ones they really liked, which ones they, you know, and sometimes you get personal stories of like, hey, I was in a dark place and your comics helped me this year. Or, or oh. you know, after my mom died, my brother and I loved your comics and that was one of the few things, you know, those kind of things. There's no amount of money that can that can that can make up for how wonderful that is for your heart. And that means no. a lot to me. I, I carry that for a long time. Oh, how many times if you had somebody come over and say something like, well, I was stationed in Iraq, I was stationed in Afghanistan and and and, and this being able to read this stuff made me feel like I was at home for maybe five minutes. Yeah. And and those are the people you just and, and, and I've had that happen a few times where or, or you know, or, or, you know, like you said, I was depressed and and this kind of gave me a little bit of solace for five minutes. Those are the people you just want to wrap up in your arms, and you know those. Those are the people. It's like that's that's finding out that you've made that kind of connection is transformative. It really is that, that you really you really want to hold on to those people uh, mentally for as long as you can. But yeah, but listen, I mean, if you. Go go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say if you look at why we became cartoonists, those moments are the distillation of what we do, which is we're not building a house for someone to live in. We're not raising yeah. food for someone to eat. We're not fixing someone's body in a hospital. But what we right. can do is for just a few minutes a day, we can make their heart a little bit lighter and a little bit more joy-filled or a little bit entertained or distracted from an illness or a death or a divorce or a lost job. That's our job is just five minutes of levity, you know, just for God's yep. sakes, just let my heart have five minutes of levity. And so when you can give that to someone and they come up and tell you about it, it means the world to us. It's it's uh, it's why we do what we do, you know, so I love it. I love Comic-Con in that regard. I think it's why I'm super energized. And then in the meantime, so, you also have someone cosplaying as a 12 foot tall Megatron walking by like that's fun, too, you know? <laughs> I, yeah, there there is a lot of neat stuff. It's like a circus of of your favorite pop culture, and there's yeah. always something going on. That that part I always loved. My one of my favorite things that I used to love doing with Brad Geiger when we would exhibit would be like, "Hey Brad, look, fat Aquaman. Hey Brad, look, fat Flash. Hey Brad, look, fat fat Batman." There's a lot of those. Those were always the fun, yeah. the fun ones and, for us. And, and and now and now those guys are looking at us and say, "Hey, take a look, couple of fat cartoonists." <laughs> <laughs> oh and my God. they're right so uh, listen i know right I, I i i we've gone a, a little bit past our typical show but i want to ask if, if there if there's one more like takeaway that you've got from the show like one more moment of inspiration or a fun idea that to share is hey, let's let's round this out with a nice positive talk about something 
that uh, you got inspired by during the show. Okay. Yes, I can do that. I can. Yes. All right. I can. I, I've got a lot, but I can. I can summarize the big one. Yeah. And the big, the big one I would give to you as a cartoonist is to think about your branding, visual branding at a comic con. Mm-hmm. So the next time you're at a comic con, walk around specifically to the expensive booths, the booths that cost between thirty and one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Everything from an Image Comics booth to uh, a Fox Studios booth, right? Like one of those ones that's just like, they just dropped a lot of cash. They just had yeah. a half a million dollars or whatever, and they just kind of drop a lot of cash. And I want you to look visually at what cues they use to tie their entire booth together with their product, with their people at their booth, with the signs at the booth, with the tables at their booth. Like how do they visually tie it all together? Not because you're going to spend $150,000, but you're going to say to yourself, what can I spend at the $10 level, at the $150 level, at the $200 level that can get me a cohesive brand or look or style at a booth? Um, and maybe all you can afford is stuff that you can hand draw. That's great. I saw some amazing booths at Comic-Con that were entirely black Sharpie on cardboard, but yeah. they did the entire booth that way. And it was kind of awesome. You know, like it was a look. Um, did it cost them anything more than $5? No, but it was a look by God. And, and so it was a cohesive branding. And yeah. then, uh, basically what I'm getting at is look at the, look at the strategies and the approaches that the expensive booths use to brand themselves and apply some of that to your, your booth. Um, I think you will see some advantages to having a cohesive look at a booth that translates both from your product to your table, to your, your, your tchotchkes that you're selling, to your signage, and to how you look. Uh, so that's, that's my big takeaway uh, that costs you nothing that you might want to incorporate into future shows. And, and how can you do this? A couple of things come to mind for me immediately, and that is, number one, obviously your logo is going to be part of that cohesive look, but also for all of your signage, for all of your uh, handouts, your flyers, uh, a- a- and stuff like this. Uh, think about the colors that you're using and the fonts you're using. You should try to limit yourself to one, maybe two fonts that you're using throughout. Those are your yep. kind of house style fonts. And yep. same thing for colors. You should have two, maybe three predominant colors that, uh, dominate your signage. And you should be and you should be mirroring that on your flyers. You should be mirroring that on any kind of handouts, uh, a, a, a table dressing, uh, drapery, stuff like that. If you can limit yourself and keep that color palette uh, short and signif- uh, and unified and limited, you're going to find that that's going to have a big impact visually. And it's going to make everything at that booth feel like a unit. And it's going to help you stick out amidst the cacophony of visuals that are around you. If you can be unified and and singular. Yeah. In case it might be helpful, uh, I recorded a quick video from Comic-Con about my booth and what I did this year. And so if you haven't gone to patreon.com slash comic lab, uh, it's probably buried a few posts down by now, but it was mm-hmm. uh, look for the dated posts that are around July. I don't know, Brad, what do you think? 19th? I um, use the here's better yet. Go to the posts section of the Patreon page for Comic Lab and click on comic conventions. I tagged it as a comic convention post. So if you click on the comic convention tag, you'll have uh, three or four uh, returns to come up with and it'll stick right out like a, like a happy little thumb. Uh, that's I didn't want to say phrase. sore thumb since I was talking about your video. I wanted it to be positive. <laughs> I just like it'll <laughs> stick out like a happy little thumb. Uh, hey doc, I got a problem here with my happy little thumb. <laughs> I got a happy um, thumb. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Um, so uh, anyway, so that might be helpful to you, but uh, I think that that, Always be always be thinking, hey, as you walk around at Comic Con, what booths work for me? What cat what caught my eye and what yeah. directed me to like a featured product easily or what showed me the prices easily or what really communicated a message, whatever it was at Comic Con, and how can I incorporate that into my work? And and Brad is right. Give yourself a limited palette of colors to work from, from your table to your signs to your flyers to your uh whatever it is on your table. 
And then I again, fonts are great. A nice, clearly to read font, clearly and easy to read font um, that's simple. We'll keep them to one or two fonts. I think that's a great point. And um, in general, uh, make it consistent from your from your logo to your characters to your table design. It's an extension of your artwork, basically. That big physical presence is an extension of your artwork. So yeah, um, design it in such a way that it all works together. Yeah, that's 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 key. Is is just keeping it consistent. I, I like that a yeah. lot. And then I think the only other thing that I would um, say, because I'm coming off a show where I'm very enthusiastic and things work right, is always be conscious of a show. Like you've just heard me talk for an hour and a half about how excited I was about Mm Comic-Con. But make sure that these are shows that you can make a profit on. Comic-Cons are no longer worth it as a marketing expense to go to if you're going to lose money or, or frankly even break even. Or maybe it's worth it if you break even, I guess. But uh, don't continue to do shows and don't try shows that you know you're not going to make money at. Um, It's not worth it. There are easier and better ways to make money online, whether you're eBaying illustrations or doing a Patreon or doing a Kickstarter or doing mini projects over that weekend. Um, So after an hour and a half of me being enthusiastic about (laughs) Comic-Con, I, as as the one who's drank the lemonade, want to tell you, as always with conventions, you want to make sure you can make money on it. Don't do it just to do it and don't do it to lose money. Yeah. In other words, what, what uh, Dave's takeaway was, this is a good show for him. He's going to do it next year. His takeaway was not, it's time to do Wizard World Idaho. Or it's, right, it's time, right, to do, right. <laughs> you know, time to do another one of these uh, smaller shows. And, and you don't see him flying out to the coast to do New York Comic Con anytime soon. Exactly. Uh, because yeah, so that's he, a so, whole different set of uh, uh, logistics that he's got to deal with. So I, I, I think your your little warning is right. It, it, make sure you classify this conversation in the right place in your brain. Right. And make sure you also quantify what I didn't say, like Brad said. I yeah. didn't say I'm going to go do TCAF right now. I didn't say I'm going to go do New right. Comic Con or Dragon Con or any of these other cons. Because, and this should be your takeaway, the reason I'm not is I don't make money at them or I make such a small amount of money that's like not worth doing for four right. days, you know? Right. So the the unspoken thing is that San Diego Comic-Con was great for Dave Kellett. I guess I should do Comic-Con. But also think of the 40 shows that I didn't mention that I don't do great at, you know? Right. So find right. the shows that you're good at. Great. Keep doing them. But don't do shows that you're not going to make money at. Yep. That's my and big takeaway for this my week, takeaway, Brad Geiger. My takeaway is I'm thrilled that you had a good show. Uh, I I can hear the excitement still in your voice. And I know that we're probably going to circle around to this topic in the shows to come and and probably hear a little bit more here and there uh, about your experiences at Comic-Con. And and I'm thrilled to hear that uh, you got so much out of that week. That's, That's really kind of amazing for me to hear. Oh my God, I forgot to tell you the one favorite thing that happened to me. Well, and then I'll let you close out the show. I almost show. had you wound down, Kellett. I was ready to say you've been listening to Comic Lab, but go uh, ahead. Get, I'm teasing, it's, like I'm calm, teasing. it's like calming down a puppy when you almost get them calm <laughs> yes. and you're like rubbing their belly. And then all of a sudden someone opens a door to, down the hallway and the puppy's like, I'm up, I'm up, I'm moving. Um, so I, I got to tell you this one last thing and then I'll let us take you out with the outro. Okay. So, on Saturday, I have come to learn, based on the quality of their shoes and because I know some of them, that Hollywood scouts come down on Saturdays after they're done with work on Friday. They drive down to San Diego and they walk around just looking for properties that they could acquire, right? Yeah. So I had two conversations about this or, or on this topic with different companies on Saturday. One that I might follow up with. And the other one, though, is the funny one that I want to share with you. Where yeah. the, this, this woman goes, oh, hey, I've been, uh, I've been reading Drive online. I, I like it. And I go, oh, thank you. And she picks up the book. She goes, oh, this is, this is the first act. And I said, yep. And, and she goes, wow, it's really nice. And uh, she goes, has anyone acquired the rights? And I go, nope. And then she goes, wow, 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 wow. That's great. Wow, wow. Like she's really thinking about it at that point, you know, looking through the yeah. book. She's vamping now while numbers go through her head. Right. And then she gets to the end of the book where it says end of act one. Right. And she goes, so how many how many pages is the is the full story going to be? And I said, "Uh, about a thousand. 
And Brad, you just see her kind of quietly put the book deck down on the sh- on the table, and then just she kind of walk, you just kind of almost like float away. Bye, bye. I gotta go now. Bye. It's like that scene in Blues Brothers where the nun just goes backwards back into her office, you know, without moving yes. her legs. She just kind yes. of floats backwards and kind of dissipates into the shadows. Do you know? Do you remember the camera shot that they that he figured out for Do the Right Thing, where they would be sitting on the dolly, and then he would add in. Foot footsteps later on in yeah. sound effects yeah that's what it was like the the acquisitions agent just kind of drifted away as though she was in do the right thing and then added fo- you know you add in sound effects of footsteps uh, so i could not have said something that disinterested her more than yep it's gonna be about a thousand pages bye gotta go <laughs> Well, it, 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 you had another secret too uh, for for these uh hollywood scouts uh to really get them interested what you did, and, and, and uh, tell me if I'm remembering this wrong, but they'd say, Hey, are you interested in having this option? You'd go, No. Are you, are you sure you're not interested? In we could, we could talk about this for a TV series. And you go, Nah, I really don't want to give up the kind of rights and, and the, and the creative control that I'd need to give up in order to do this. And uh, no, I'm really not interested. And all of a sudden, when you would say no, these guys would get really super interested in option. That is stuff. true. <laughs> that is true. That would, that would happen. The and best the way, way to I get remember... these people on the hook was to tell them you didn't want anything to do with them. And then they wanted you desperately. <laughs> yeah. It's like high school all over again. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I remember the conversation you talked about because I have never, there was somebody from Nickelodeon or something that wanted to talk about Sheldon. Yeah, And I've never wanted to, op- like, I'm super willing to option drive. For whatever reason, I never wanted to option Sheldon. I was like, I was just not interested in it. Mm-hmm. And I remember that you would be like, holy shit, that works. Saying no works. Like, they were, we were amazed. And so then I was doing it the rest of that that show. Yeah. And like, nope, not, not interested. <laughs> And then anyway. I do you remember that time when the when the scout came up to me and uh, he said, yeah, have you ever thought about optioning this? And I said, no. And he said, well, that's probably for the best and walked away. And I'm like, how? <laughs> what? When, John... when, there's nothing funnier than when you're self-deprecating. I love it. <laughs> oh, oh, I wish it was self-deprecating. But anyway, uh, yeah, that was that was one of my uh, uh, fondest memories. But I, I yeah. Oh, what, what was the second? Well, it's also what was the second agent? Knowing what I know about Hollywood, too. It's like whenever a cartoonist gets real excited about like, oh, yeah, they optioned my title for a movie. I'm always like, yeah, yeah great. Good for you. Because ninety nine point nine percent of the time, nothing's going to happen with that option. You know, like. Yep. And and very often the unspoken truth is they only gave me two thousand dollars for this option. You know, like it's not a lot of money. And it's they're going to hold it for two years, and nothing's going to happen to it. So great if you if you can get it, uh, go ahead, option away uh, as long as you were well represented. But it's not a lot. Sometimes it's not a lot of money, and most of the time nothing happens with it. So, um, but that being said, you and I both have friends that have optioned the same title four times, and it just takes whatever <laughs> check, and then options it again two years later. Yep. So that's fine. So anyway. I am thrilled to hear you had a good time at the show. I am looking forward to hearing more as the uh, as the months go on, and I have nothing yet to add except that checking to see if anybody's coming in the door. Nope, my puppy has settled down. You've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been Puppy Wrangler Brad Geiger, <laughs> the editor of webcomics.com and the cartoonist of Evil Inc. at evil-comic.com. And the amazing and, and uh, I'm, I'm getting a lost for words, avuncular Dave Kellett, co-director of Stripped and cartoonist of Sheldon at sheldoncomics.com and drive at drivecomic.com. And the fantastic Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. And this particular episode was edited by the fantastic Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions. You can find him at www.woodsong.media. Boy, I don't want to be Matt today. This is We gave him a handful. <laughs> <laughs> Comic Lab is made possible by your support on patreon.com slash comic lab. So we'll go ahead and say that twice patreon.com slash comic lab. <laughs>